The models do capture the, the general overall trends of past climate correctly. If you set them up with the conditions appropriate for 50 million years ago, including higher greenhouse gas concentrations, the models are significantly warmer than today, which is an important lesson as you go in forward into the future. You mean if we carried on pumping out carbon dioxide as fast as we can, yeah. which is effectively what we're doing at the moment, um, you know, we would be talking about carbon dioxide levels by the end of this century heading up towards 1,000 parts per million, so well past double pre-industrial, heading on for more like three or even four times pre-industrial levels of carbon dioxide. We would expect three to four degrees of warming at a minimum. It seems that winter essentially disappears. Winter as we know it disappears. The dry areas of the planet get drier, and the wet areas of the planet are probably going to get wetter. So if you live in a place that's marginal, it's right on the fringe between the wet area and the dry area, it's probably very bad news, because in this case, it, it probably means that that area is going to dry out. So we could be talking about the Sahel, we could be talking about the northern margin of the Mediterranean area. And Australia, which is completely dry in its, in its heart, but, but sort of wet around the fringes, is actually especially going to have a problem because the models predict substantial drying and, and intense warming in places like Australia. And they don't really have anywhere to go. What our drilling seems to be telling us, combined with the, the ice sheet modeling, is that in 100 years, we would expect to see about a metre of sea level rise. And I think there's good agreement of that generally within the scientific community, that a metre of sea level rise per century is reasonable and will occur for the next 1,000 years. So you get to 1,000 years from now, you've got 10 metre higher sea level, Greenland's deglaciated, and the West Antarctic ice sheet has gone. That's going to have profound effects on the whole biological systems in the Southern Ocean and around Antarctica, which are fundamental in terms of the ocean food chain. It's a very different planet. Sea level's 10 metres higher in 1,000 years. Seems a long time. But a metre in 100 years, it gets me a little bit worried. It's going to have very expensive effects. It's going to eat up all the valuable beachfront property around the planet, and, you know, that's very valuable property. It is quite sobering sometimes to think, looking at our climate model output, you know, the world really could be like this in 50 or 80 years' time when my children will still be alive. The way I look at it is that actually it's the, the, the future is sort of like rewinding a tape. We're going to blow through the warm period of the Pliocene within the next 30 or 40 years. So that takes us back 3 million years. Then we're going to go back to the Miocene climatic optimum 18 million years ago in the next 100 years. And if we're still committed to burning carbon, then we will pass through the Eocene Oligocene transition where, where the ice sheet in Antarctica formed and be more or less irrevocably consigned to the idea that we will lose both ice sheets and live in a substantially warmer world. And whether that happens or not, interestingly enough, depends on our decisions in the next 20 years because that's when we decide what emissions pathway we're going to be on.